Amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand with me this morning? Got a lot on the agenda today, but it's time for the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen? If you have your Bibles with me, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. Five verses of Scripture on this baby dedication Sunday. In our Going Deeper series, we're adding a message here on baby dedication day. It's called Come as a Child. Come as a Child. What better day to talk about childlike faith than on this Sunday of baby dedication. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and he said, Assuredly, it's a matter of fact, let me say this without any hesitation. I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name, Jesus said, receives me. Father, we ask your blessings on the word. We thank you for how you have ministered in this service, your presence, your work in the lives of these families. We ask your blessings now as you challenge us by your spirit with your precious word today. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. A group of expectant fathers were in a waiting room while their wives were in the process of delivering babies. A nurse came in and announced to the first waiting father-to-be, she said, you have twins. He said, what a coincidence. I actually play for the Minnesota Twins. A few minutes later, another nurse came running in and announced to the second man that he was the father of triplets. He said, that is amazing. I work for the 3M company. Look, I work hard for these things. <laughs> Third man slipped off his chair, fell in the floor, crying profusely. Another gentleman helped him up and said, Sir, are you okay? No, he responded. I work for 7-Up Company. <laughs> How'd you like that, Denny? That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> He's like, don't talk to me. <laughs> this guy did not appreciate the biblical concept of children. Seven would be great. God blesses every family and every life with, with babies. Mark Twain obviously didn't get it either. He had a philosophy about teenagers. He said this, when a kid turns 13, stick him in a barrel, nail the lid shut, and feed him through the knot hole. When he turns 16, plug the hole. <laughs> terrible, terrible, that's horrible. He didn't understand the blessing of little children and how that God has ordained them in our lives. In the Old Testament, children, especially orphans, along with widows, are honored, given special protection by God, holding a special place of favor in God's eyes. In the New Testament, we have the example of Jesus literally contradicting the disciples who were trying to do crowd control by keeping children away from him. And he insisted that the children were able to come to him. I tell you what, this says something about a man or a woman who's lived their lives and little children love them. There's something about their life that's special and honored, and it's a lot like heaven. So in our text, we got this question being asked by the disciples who were constantly looking for promotion. They're constantly looking for, how can I get a, a, a leg up? How can I get you know, to the top of the pile? How in the world can I get where I'm trying to get to? And they said, who then is, Jesus, the greatest in the kingdom? You see Jesus, you see him as he spies the crowd and looks around and he sees a little kid. And he says, 
Come to me. And the little child walks up to Jesus wide-eyed, stands there, and Jesus brings the little child into the crowd and says, unless you become like this little child, you won't even see the kingdom. You'll have no part with me. For this is what the kingdom of God is made up of. Now, what kind of message is that sending to the disciples? Number one, the importance of children. But number two, something mysterious that I want us to look at today, especially on baby dedication. Jesus welcomed babies, took them into his arms and blessed them. He didn't see them as an interruption or an annoyance to his life. They were worthy of his attention and his time. And his actions were contrary to the disciples. Jesus actually held up a child as an example of faith. An example of the kingdom of God. Look into the face of your children. See heaven. You want to find Jesus? You want to, you want to locate him? You want to figure out who he is? Look into the face of your baby. Look into the face of your grandchild. There you'll see heaven. There's something amazing. Today we brought all the parents up and we charged them to be good parents. And we anointed them and prayed over them. We gave them a Bible and we gave them a certificate so they'll always remember this is a very special day when you brought your child into the temple, into the sanctuary of God at the altar to dedicate them to the Lord. But yet, we're seeing in the scripture that there's something amazing about this responsibility, about this dedication of babies. It's that there's a mystery involved. Yes, we're to teach them but we're also to look into their lives and see something deeper. We're to see something we need to learn. You've been given a beautiful baby, Tyler. Little Zeke, awesome little guy. And you've been given responsibility to raise him. Brittany, to raise him. Not only to be a successful man, to take care of his man, his family and to have a job and to learn a trade, to be a decent man, but you're also responsible for his soul to raise him in the fear and the admonition of God. Let no one, let nothing stop you or hinder you in this life from doing that most important job. But also, remember what we say today, in his face, in his cradled little body in your arms, you'll see Jesus. You'll see things you need to learn. Becoming a parent changes you. It turns you inside out. It relieves you of selfishness. It opens you up to things you never dreamed were possible. It's something that we learn and we see through the love of God. The beauty of heaven in their face the honor of seeing the gift of God in their little expressions and in their need. What is it about a child that Jesus was wanting to point out to us? What was it that he was wanting us to get? What's in the mystery? Simply this, as we grow, and as we become mature, Christian, we grow in our faith and become men of God. The mystery is, we'll become more and more and more like a child. We'll become like a child. Unless we're willing, the Bible says we can't even know God. Jesus rebuked the disciples for their assumptions of greatness. Now, you've got to be careful because the world will tell you what their definition of greatness is. You know, we are constantly fighting the philosophies of this world that try to change us, re-educate us, retransform us into them. But understand and know this. The Bible talks about broad. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. 
We have to understand there's simple truths that are sacred to the text of the scripture which we use as our model and our example, our roadmap to life and the relationship of God to our souls that we see. We learned this morning that we see that in the face of our children. The one who will be great in the kingdom will not be the self-assured, self-reliant, self-serving, successful business woman or man. But the one that will be shining brightest in the kingdom of God will be one who's like a child. Like a child. Well, what is the example? What is it for? Is it because they're born in such innocence? Is it because they're born in, in such moral purity? They've not been around long enough to do anything wrong? Is it that we've got to literally be so unpolluted by the world, we've got to turn and go back? That's impossible. It's impossible to return to our childhood. It's impossible to go back and be innocent. And in some cases, impossible to go back to moral purity we have fallen we have failed so many times none in this place not one stands righteous before god no one if we count sins among us we'll all run out the back door because no one can stand but in becoming like a child heart like a child we see the answers and the mysteries to the kingdom I'm reminded of Nicodemus who would have been in the same spot we're in today well what is it about a baby what is it about a child that speaks to us about faith and about God John chapter 3 and verse 3 reading through verse 4 it says Jesus answered and said to him talking to Nicodemus most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, there's our dilemma. How in the world, and Nicodemus was like, how in the world can I go back? How can I go back to my childhood? How can I be reborn? We hear about it, and the world jokes about it, but technically, this is the scripture where it describes the experience of what God's trying to get across to us. We are born again through faith in Christ Jesus. But it is not something as ridiculous as going back into your mother's womb or going back into your embryo stage or going back to being a child. It's not talking about taking on the characteristics of a four-year-old. That's ridiculous. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said no. And we say no today. That's not what it's talking about. It starts with a simple understanding of who a child, what a child is. It's the gift. Yes, it's innocent. It has no illusions of being in control. A child is needy. I look at little, little Zechariah, and when I hold him in my hands and my arms, and I see that he has to go from me to somebody else. Right now he's with grandma. He's got to go from her to mom or to dad or to someone else. He can't just get up and walk by himself and go away. He can't go do what he wants at this point. He, he's completely, I call it the meatloaf stage. He just kind of sits there, smiles every now and again. I know what they say, but he's really smiling. He's completely, he's completely unpretentious. He's, he's not in control. He's needy. They, they more or less dictate when he goes to bed, when he gets up, when he eats, when he doesn't eat, what he does, what he doesn't do. As he gets older, he'll be told no a lot. He won't be able to do things. He'll be allowed to do other things. They'll decide what he watches on television. They'll decide where he goes to school, when he gets up for school, when he goes to bed to be okay for school. They, they 
teach him what he can drink and what he can't drink as a child. His life is completely controlled by their influence. God said, become a child. Because I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to give you health and to give you hope and to give you a future. I've bankrupt the very throne of God in sending my son to give his life so that you would be free from the bondages of sin and slavery in this life. Come to me as a child. Be dependent upon me. That's what God is saying. We see it as losing control, and God see it as, sees it as the ultimate liberation, the ultimate freedom. He wants you to know your destiny. He wants you to know what he has for you. I play, prayed over each of these children the fact, the fact that the Bible teaches that God has a destiny and a plan for each one of them. And I pray that neither life nor person nor angels nor depth nor principalities, nothing can separate them from that plan. The love, the destiny that God has for them. No forces, whether it's school, whether it's the world, Democrats or Republicans, no matter who it is that they not detour left or right from the plan that God has for them. So you know, it's the same for us adults. And that's the point. We're all controlled. We say, no way, man. I'm totally in control of my life. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody dictates to me anything. So go get in your car. Put your seatbelt on. Drive the speed limit. Go home. Go to work when the boss tells you to. Get up. Get paid what he says he'll pay you. Come home. Pay the bills that you can't afford. And buy the house and live in the house that you can afford. And keep on living your life controlled. Controlled. Whether it's insurance rates, salaries, electric bills, or grass that grows too tall in your yard, you're controlled by outside influences and forces. You are not your own. And granted, we have freedoms in America that that are wonderful, and, and we have freedoms that others in other countries don't have, and we thank God for our liberty in the United States, but our range of liberty only goes so far. Literally, there are limits, laws. I used to argue against the speed, speed law because I said it's not a speed law, it's a limit. So if it says 35, I can go 40, 45, because it's a limit after all. I was quickly reprimanded by a sheriff who said, no, <laughs> it's a law. So in our humanity, we're controlled by the forces around us. You genuinely are. I mean, you are not your own. Even though you demand it and act like a, like a small child who, who wants to go out and play wherever he wants and do whatever he wants and get dirty doing whatever he wants, he comes in, he's like, I'm on my own. I want to do it. No, mommy, No. He thinks he's in control, but he's not. Smack. <laughs> You're grounded. No cookie for you. So we're, we're controlled by the forces around us, but we're also unbelievably true. It, God is sovereign, and God is a powerful force in the earth. We're controlled by gravity. We're controlled by the, the orbit. We're controlled by the universe. We're controlled by the air that we've been given and that we breathe. You think you're on your own? You're on borrowed life. You're on borrowed life. Every second, every minute that your heart is beating. You ever put your hand over your heart and listen to it beat and wonder how it knows to just keep going when you're not even paying attention to it? God. God. God is the outside force. He allows you to live your life, to live it in the freedom. And I love what Brother Swift said this morning. God even loves you so much and counts your life, your freedoms, your will so important. And yet at the same time regards sin so strongly that God will even let you reap what you sow. Did you hear that? God loves you enough and honors his word and the powerful force of his life enough that he will allow you to reap what you sow. 
And yet, is love. Christian went on to point out that the same God who allows you to reap what you sow stares off into the horizon just waiting for you to come over the hill like the prodigal son. The Bible says God ran. God ran. Not when the boy came to the front porch and went through his speech and apologized. He said, when he saw him yet a great distance away, he ran. Oh, the love of Jesus. Oh, the love of the Lord. He says, you want to be in my kingdom? Believe me, get starry-eyed again. Get wide-eyed in faith. Trust and let me lead you. Let me guide you. Let me help you to learn in wisdom how to live a life full of success. I'm not asking you to give me your life because I'm an oppressor and a dictator and because I don't want you to enjoy this life I've given you. He says, I want to give you life and life more abundant. I want to give you joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. I want to give you peace that you can't even comprehend or understand. In this life, we run to and fro from one tavern to the next. We run in our lives trying to fill every void we have with drugs and pills and all kinds of entertainments. And all along, God stands there on his throne beckoning to the world with love. I gave my only begotten son that you might have life. Oh, hear the truth. Become like a child. Become like a child. We've become so smart that we don't know nothing. We don't believe nothing. We don't stand for nothing. We've become so smart. Jesus says, who will be greatest? Who will be greatest? Come here. He puts the child in front of you. Become like him. And if you can't see this truth, then you'll never see me. It's about relinquishing and understanding that we are not in control. So, why are we fighting? Why do we struggle? You know, before I got saved, I sat there that night and I wrestled the entire service. I knew I needed to go get saved. I know, I knew my life. I, nobody, I don't have to walk up to somebody and say, you sinned. You're a sinner. You're lost. I don't have to tell people that. I knew. I don't go around telling everybody, shame on you. I don't do that. I sat there as an 18-year-old while the preacher was preaching and the songs were being sung and my heart was beating out of my chest and I felt the power of God's Holy Spirit convicting my heart. I knew I needed help. I knew I needed a Savior. I knew I needed God. I knew it. I knew the answer to life was not found in more books, doctors, and psychiatrists. I couldn't find the peace in a pill. I couldn't find it in a bottle. It wasn't there as often as I did it. The next morning, it was still there facing me. I knew that wasn't my answers. I could, it couldn't be. And oh, but it was when I heard the organ playing and the preacher made the invitation that I finally got the courage to stop have to having control. I stopped trying to be in control of my own emotions and my own life. And I said, God, if you are there, I need you. I stepped out of my seat and all by myself, nobody pulling on me. I walked to the front. When I got down there, I couldn't believe the peace and the joy and the love that filled my life. I've not regretted one minute since I gave my life to Christ. I've not regretted one moment. I have enjoyed it. I, I, yeah, I'm one of those Christian people, but I promise you I'm a cool one. I'm a cool one. 
I'm not out to preach at you. I'm not out to rip you apart and tear you down. I'm here to lift you up, to take you up with a message that I can't save you, I can't fix you, but I know who can, and he is on the throne, and he's in control. He's in control. He can change your night today. He can change your sorrow to joy. He can turn your midnight into a bright and beautiful morning. That's God. It's not religion. It's not a church. It's not a preacher. It is a God who loves you and brought the sun up good and right this morning. It's that God who loves you with all that you are and every good and bad and ugly thing about you. He loves you enough. He said that while we were yet sinners... While we were yet ugly, mean, snake in the grass, he loved us. The old song, Brother McLean, got saved too way back at Harlem Park in the 70s when he was testifying about it. He said, I was lost and undone without God or his son. When he reached down his hand for me. Did you hear that? I was lost and undone without God or his son. When, when he reached. I see the picture of Peter sinking in the waters and the storm is raging all around him. And he doesn't know what to do and he says, help. Jesus, walking out on that water, reaches down and pulls him up. Now, God is not against you. He's for you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to have victory. He wants you to know his life, man. I know churches have ruined it. I know preachers have ruined it. All kinds of stuff has gone wrong. I know that. If that's all, I've said this many times, but all of it, if all it takes is one stinking, rotten hypocrite on a church pew to get you to throw God away, well, then you didn't have much to begin with in the first place. I am not in church today based on you. I don't come here because of you. I'm not watching you. I'm not listening to you. I'm not following you. I am not here because of you. I'm here because of him. He loved me and he gave his life for me. And I am a son of the living God. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. James chapter 4 and verse 13. Come now, you who say tomorrow or today we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. We're dependent upon God. That's the fresh start, the second chance, the transformation. Being reborn is not going back to your childhood. It's coming into a new understanding. Old things are now passed away. All things become new. I am a new creature in Christ. I was a grump before I met Christ. I was violent before I met Christ. I was a rotten, low-down sinner before I met Christ. But when I met him, I was born again. I'm a new man. I'm a new woman. I am a child of God. That's what being born again is all about. It's about a new mind, transformed by the renewing of our minds. It's about a brand new walk, a brand new life where he says, I will guide you. I will keep you. I will protect you. I will be with you. Clear up to your last hour. I will present you faultless before the Father. His desire is to pre present you as his beautiful, pristine bride, the church, his bride before Father God. He wants nothing more than for you to succeed. God is not looking to punish you. He's not looking to throw you in hell. He's not looking to judge 
judge you and condemn you and trash you. He wants you to know life and he wants you to know forgiveness and mercy. He wants you to know him as your savior. He wants to rescue. You've done it your way. You've done it your way. Control. You've done it your way. How far has it got you? You've been in control. You've made your own choices, your own decisions. I've worked out my own salvation. I've worked out my own theology. I am my own person. The church will never dictate to me. The preacher will never tell me how to live life. I'm doing my own thing. How's that work for you? Peace that flows like a river. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Steps ordered everywhere you go. Blessed left and right. Blessed coming in. Blessed going out. Miracles happen left and right. You got so much. I'm looking at Sister Robinson. I can't help it. I got to keep telling folks. Diagnosed with stage three uh, uh, kidney. Kidney disease. Literally. Kidneys failing, faltering. Got a word that something was messed up and wrong. She came down to an altar and said, God can take care of this. We anointed her with oil. Prayed the prayer of faith according to James chapter 5 in the New Testament. She walked away, went to the doctor, had the blood work. He comes in shaking his head and scratching his head. He doesn't understand. He's got one report that says stage 3 kidney disease. He's got another one that says she's absolutely perfectly fine. She's been healed by God power that is what I'm talking about amen that's what I'm talking about faith that moves mountains miracles miracle after miracle after miracle sign me up for kids ministry Lord sign me up for the kids ministry I want to be like Zeke I want to be like Tinsley. Little Sarah. I ain't going to call all 14 or all 13. Stand with me this morning. When my Savior reached out for me. Sing it with him. Sing it, singers. Sing it out. When he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his son. When he reached down. lightly with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning in just a moment as a matter of fact while I'm making this invitation if you'd like special prayer today if you'd like the, our pastors to anoint you with oil and pray with you about anything in the world if you've got a physical need a spiritual need of any kind you're welcome to step out and meet them in the altar they'll pray with you while we're doing this invitation but I want to talk to you today if you're here and you you don't have that peace settled in your heart and in your life. Every Christian praying with me right now, I believe in the power of prayer. You're here today and you, you don't have all those questions answered in your life. You, you haven't figured it out. You, you've been trying to do it on your own. And here you stand today. You need a Savior. You need Jesus. I won't belabor the point. I'm just going to ask you. Either the Holy Spirit has prepared your heart already or, or you're just not ready yourself at this time. If you need Jesus in your heart and in your life, my prayer is that you will pray with us a prayer. You can, we're gonna make an altar right where you stand. It's a simple prayer. It's just a few words that talks about he's the son of God. And you ask him to come into your life and to forgive you of all your sins and accept him as your Lord. 
And I'm telling you, that simple prayer, if prayed from your heart, is absolutely going to transform and change your whole life. You will not be the same man, the same woman that you were when you came into this house. If you'd like to pray that prayer this morning to receive Jesus, to pray it right where you are and make an altar there. If you'd pray it, would you just slip up your hand and write back down and say, Pastor, I'm going to pray with you right now. God bless you. Any others? Anyone else? I need to pray that prayer this morning, Pastor. I need Jesus in my heart and in my life. I want to make things right with God. Would you just slip up your hand and write back down? God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. A few seconds. I'll wait just a few more moments. So one that would say, I need Jesus, and I don't want to leave this house until I've secured my relationship with Christ. Are you here? All right, these that have lifted their hands, we're going to pray a prayer today. It's going to change your whole life. I'm believing with you that you will be a completely born again, brand new child of God. If you lifted your hand or perhaps you didn't, but you want to pray this prayer, I'm telling you, you can pray it right here, right now. The church, let's all pray this together. Would you help me? Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I know that you're the Son of God. You died on the cross for me. You rose from the dead. You purchased my salvation. I come to you today. I need a Savior. Save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I would invite you at this time, anyone who feels like you'd like to spend some time just finding a corner somewhere and praying in the altar, please understand you're totally, it's okay, it's, it's fine, you're, you're good to just pray anywhere you'd like. We want the altars to always be open to you if you'd like to take a season of prayer. But let's all be bow, let's all bow together for those who, who are going to be leaving. Let's pray together this morning in a closing dismissal prayer. Father, as we come before you, I thank you for all of these children that have been dedicated. I thank you for these that have come, Lord, and, and now will leave as a child of God. I pray that you will bless every man, every woman, every boy and girl that's here today. Let your work be accomplished in their lives as we desire, Lord, to please you and to honor you. I praise you and I thank you as you challenge us today to become more like children in our faith, in our neediness of you, realizing that your power, your power, Lord, wants to bring complete victory to our lives. Christ, your name we pray as we go from this place. The church is not dismissed, but the church is simply leaving the building. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you this evening at 6 p.m.